Ninth House, by Lee Bardugo. Prologue. Early Spring. By the time Alex managed to get the blood out of her goodwill coat, it was too warm to wear it. Spring had come on grudgingly, pale blue mornings failed to deepen, turning instead to moist, sullen afternoons, and stubborn frost lined the road in high, dirty meringues. But sometime around mid-March, the slices of lawn between the stone paths of old campus began to sweat themselves free of snow, emerging wet, black, and tufty with matted grass, and Alex found herself notched into the window seat in the rooms hidden on the top floor of 268 York, reading suggested requirements for Lethe candidates. She heard the clock on the mantel tick, the chiming of the bell as customers came and went in the clothing store below. The secret rooms above the shop were affectionately known as the Hutch by Lethe members, and the commercial space beneath them had been, at varying times, a shoe store, a wilderness outfitter, and a 24-hour Wawa minimart with its own Taco Bell counter. The Lethe diaries from those years were filled with complaints about the stink of refried beans and grilled onions seeping up through the floor, until 1995, when someone had enchanted the hutch in the back staircase that led to the alley so that they smelled always of fabric softener and clove. Alex had discovered the pamphlet of Lethe House Guidelines sometime in the blurred weeks after the incident at the mansion on Orange. She had checked her email only once since then on the Hutch's old desktop, seen the long string of messages from Dean Sando, and logged off. She'd let the battery run down on her phone, ignored her classes, watched the branches. Sprout leaves at the knuckles like a woman trying on rings. She ate all the food in the pantries and freezer, the fancy cheeses and packs of smoked salmon first, then the cans of beans and syrup-soaked peaches in boxes marked emergency rations. When they were gone, she ordered takeout aggressively, charging it all to Darlington's still-active account. The trip down and up the stairs was tiring enough that she had to rest before she tore into her lunch or dinner, and sometimes she didn't bother to eat at all just fell asleep in the window seat or on the floor beside the plastic bags and foil-wrapped containers. No one came to check on her. There was no one left. The pamphlet was cheaply printed, bound with staples, a black-and-white picture of Harkness Tower on the cover, We Are the Shepherds, printed beneath it. She doubted the Lethe house founders had Johnny Cash in mind when they'd chosen their motto, but every time she saw those words she thought of Christmas time of lying on the old mattress in Len's squad in Van Nuys, room spinning, a half-eaten can of cranberry sauce on the floor beside her, and Johnny Cash singing, We are the shepherds, we walked across the mountains. We left our flocks when the new star appeared. She thought of Len rolling over, sliding his hand under her shirt, murmuring into her ear, Those are some shitty shepherds. The guidelines for Lethe House candidates were located near the back of the pamphlet and had last been updated in 1962. High academic achievement, with an emphasis on history and chemistry. Facility with languages and a working knowledge of Latin and Greek. Good physical health and hygiene. Evidence of a regular fitness regimen encouraged. Exhibit signs of a steady character with a mind toward discretion. An interest in the arcane is discouraged, as this is a frequent indicator of an outsider disposition. Should demonstrate no squeamishness toward the realities of the human body. Moore's Vincent Omnia. Alex, whose knowledge of Latin was less than working, looked it up, death conquers all. But in the margin, someone had scrawled Iramat over Vincent, nearly obliterating the original with blue ballpoint pen. Beneath the Lethe requirements, an addendum read, standards for candidates have been relaxed in two circumstances, Lowell Scott, B.A., English, 1909, and Sinclair Bell Braverman, No Degree, 1950, with mixed results. Another note had been scratched into the margin here, this one clearly in Darlington's jagged, EKG-like scrawl, Alex Stern. She thought of the blood soaking the carpet of the old Anderson mansion black. She thought of the dean, the startled white of his femur jutting from his thigh, the stink of wild dogs filling the air. 
Alex set aside the aluminum container of cold falafel from Mamoon's, wiped her hands on her lethe house sweats. She limped to the bathroom, popped open the bottle of zalpedum, and tucked one beneath her tongue. She cupped her hand beneath the faucet, watched the water pour over her fingers, listened to the grim sucking sound from the mouth of the drain. Standards for candidates have been relaxed in two circumstances. For the first time in weeks, she looked at the girl in the water-speckled mirror, watched as that bruised girl lifted her tank top, the cotton stained yellow with pus. The wound in Alex's side was a deep divot, crusted black. The bite had left a visible curve that she knew would heal badly, if it healed at all. Her map had been changed. Her coastline altered. Moore's Earmat Omnia. Death fucks us all. Alex touched her fingers gently to the hot red skin surrounding the teeth marks. The wound was getting infected. She felt some kind of concern, her mind nudging her towards self-preservation, but the idea of picking up the phone, getting a ride to the undergrad health center, the sequence of actions each new action would incite, was overwhelming, and the warm, dull throb of her body setting fire to itself had become almost companionable. Maybe she'd get a fever, start hallucinating. She eyed the thrust of her ribs, the blue veins like downed power lines beneath her fading bruises. Her lips were feathered with chapped skin. She thought of her name inked into the margins of the pamphlet, the third circumstance. Results were decidedly mixed, she said, startled by the husky rattle of her voice. She laughed and the drain seemed to chuckle with her. Maybe she already had a fever. In the fluorescent glare of the bathroom lights, she gripped the edges of the bite in her side and dug her fingers into it, pinching the flesh around her stitches until the pain dropped over her like a mantle, the blackout coming on in a welcome rush. That was in the spring. But the trouble had begun on a night in the full dark of winter, when Tara Hutchins died and Alex still thought she might get away with everything. Alex hurried across the wide, alien plain of Beinecke Plaza, boots thudding over flat squares of clean concrete. The giant cube of the rare books collection seemed to float above its lower story. During the day its panels glowed amber, a burnished golden hive, less a library than a temple. At night it just looked like a tomb. This part of campus didn't quite fit with the rest of Yale, no grey stone or gothic arches no rebellious little outcroppings of red brick buildings, which Darlington had explained were not actually colonial but only meant to look that way. He'd explained the reasons for the way Beinecke had been built, the way it was supposed to mirror and slot into this corner of the campus architecture, but it still felt like a 70s sci-fi movie to her, like the students should all be wearing unitards or two short tunics, drinking something called the extract, eating food and pellets. Even the big metal sculpture that she now knew was by Alexander Calder reminded her of a giant lava lamp in negative. It's Calder, she murmured beneath her breath. That was the way people here talked about art. Nothing was by anyone. The sculpture is Calder. The painting is Rothko. The house is Neutra. And Alex was late. She had begun the night with good intentions determined to get ahead of her modern British novel essay and leave with plenty of time to make it to the prognostication. But she'd fallen asleep in one of the Sterling Library reading rooms, a copy of Nostromo gripped loosely in her hand, feet propped on a heating duct. At half-past ten, she'd woken with a start, drool trickling across her cheek. Her startled shit had gone off like a shotgun blast in the quiet of the library, and she'd buried her face in her scarf as she slung her bag over her shoulder and made her escape. Now she cut through commons, beneath the rotunda where the names of the war dead were carved deep into the marble, and stone figures stood vigil. Peace, devotion, memory, and finally courage, who wore a helmet and shield and little else and had always looked to Alex more like a stripper than a mourner. She charged down the steps and across the intersection of college and grove. The campus had a way of changing faces from hour to hour and block to block so that Alex always felt as if she were meeting it for the first time. 
Tonight it was a sleepwalker, breathing deep and even. The people she passed on her way to SSS seemed locked in a dream, soft-eyed, faces turned to one another, steam rising off the cups of coffee in their gloved hands. She had the eerie sense that they were dreaming her, a girl in a dark coat who would disappear when they woke. Sheffield Sterling Strathcona Hall was drowsing too, the classrooms closed up tight, hallways cast in energy-saving half-light. Alex took the stairs to the second floor and heard noise echoing from one of the lecture halls. The Yale Social screened movies there every Thursday night. Mercy had tacked the schedule to the door of their dorm room, but Alex hadn't bothered to study it. Her Thursdays were full. Trip Helmuth slouched against the wall beside the doors to the lecture hall. He acknowledged Alex with a heavy-lidded nod. Even in the dim light, she could see his eyes were bloodshot. No doubt he'd smoked before he showed up tonight. Maybe that was why the elder bonesman had stuck him on guard duty. Or maybe he'd volunteered. You're late, he said. They started. Alex ignored him, glanced once over her shoulder to make sure the hallway was clear. She didn't owe Trip Helmuth an excuse, and it would look weak to offer one. She pressed her thumb into a barely visible notch in the paneling. The wall was supposed to swing open smoothly, but it always stuck. She gave it a hard nudge with her shoulder and stumbled as it jolted open. Easy, killer, said Trip. Alex shut the door behind her and edged down the narrow passage in the dark. Unfortunately, Trip was right. The prognostication had already begun. Alex entered the old operating theater as quietly as she could. The room was a windowless chamber, sandwiched between the lecture hall and a classroom that grad students used for discussion sections. It was a forgotten remnant of the old medical school, which had held its classes here in SSS before it moved to its own buildings. The managers of the trust that funded Skull and Bones had sealed up the room's entrance and disguised it with new paneling sometime around 1932. All facts Alex had gleaned from Lethe, a legacy when she probably should have been reading Nostromo. No one spared Alex a glance. All eyes were on the Harrispecs, his lean face hidden behind a surgical mask, pale blue robes spattered with blood. His latex-gloved hands moved methodically through the bowels of the Yi patient. Subject? Sacrifice? Alex wasn't sure which term applied to the man on the table. Not sacrifice. He's supposed to live. Ensuring that was part of her job. She'd see him safely through this ordeal and back to the hospital ward he'd been taken from. But what about a year from now? She wondered. Five years from now? Alex glanced at the man on the table, Michael Reyes. She'd read his file two weeks ago, when he was selected for the ritual. The flaps of his stomach were pinned back with steel clips and his abdomen looked like it was blooming, a plump pink orchid, plush and red at its center. Tell me that doesn't leave a mark. But she had her own future to worry about. Reyes would manage. Alex averted her eyes, tried to breathe through her nose as her stomach roiled and coppery saliva flooded her mouth. She'd seen plenty of bad injuries, but always on the dead. There was something much worse about a living wound, a human body tethered to life by nothing but the steady metallic beep of a monitor. She had candied ginger in her pocket for nausea. One of Darlington's tips, but she couldn't quite bring herself to take it out and unwrap it. Instead, she focused her gaze on some middle distance as the Harrispecs called out a series of numbers and letters, stock symbols and share prices for companies traded publicly on the New York Stock Exchange. Later in the night he'd move on to the Nasdaq, Euronext, and the Asian markets. Alex didn't bother trying to decipher them. The orders to buy, sell, or hold were given in impenetrable Dutch, the language of commerce, the first. Stock Exchange, Old New York, and the official language of the Bonesmen. When Skull and Bones was founded, too many students knew Greek and Latin. Their dealings had required something more obscure. 
Dutch is harder to pronounce, Darlington had told her. Besides, it gives the bonesmen an excuse to visit Amsterdam. Of course, Darlington knew Latin, Greek, and Dutch. He also spoke French, Mandarin, and passable Portuguese. Alex had just started Spanish, too. Between the classes she'd taken in grade school and her grandmother's mishmash of Ladino sayings, she thought it would be an easy grade. She hadn't counted on things like the subjunctive. But she could just about ask if Gloria might like to go to the discotheque tomorrow night. A burst of muffled gunfire rattled through the wall from the screening next door. The Harrispecs looked up from the slick pink mess of Michael Reyes's small intestine, his irritation apparent. Scarface, Alex realized as the music swelled and a chorus of rowdy voices thundered in unison, You wanna fuck with me? Okay. You wanna play rough? The audience chanting along like it was rocky horror. She must have seen Scarface a hundred times. It was one of Len's favorites. He was predictable that way, loved everything hard, as if he'd mailed away for a how-to-be gangster kit. When they'd met Hell Lie near the Venice boardwalk, her golden hair like a parted curtain for the theater of her big blue eyes, Alex had thought instantly of Michelle Pfeiffer in her satin shift. All she'd been missing was the smooth sheaf of bangs. But Alex didn't want to think about Hell Lie tonight, not with the stink of blood in the air. Len and Hell Lie were her old life. They didn't belong at Yale. Then again, neither did Alex. Despite the memories, Alex was grateful for any noise that would cover the wet sounds of the Harrispecs pawing through Michael Reyes's gut. What did he see there? Darlington had said the prognostications were no different than someone reading the future in the cards of a tarot deck or a handful of animal bones. But it sure looked different. And sounded more specific. You're missing someone. You will find happiness in the new year. Those were the kinds of things fortune tellers said, vague, comforting. Alex eyed the bonesmen, robed and hooded, crowded around the body on the table, the undergrad scribe taking down the predictions that would be passed on to hedge fund managers and private investors all over the world to keep the bonesmen and their alumni financially secure. Former presidents, diplomats, at least one director of the CIA, all of them bonesmen. Alex thought of Tony Montana, soaking in his hot tub, speechifying, You know what capitalism is? Alex glanced at Michael Reyes's prone body. Tony, you have no idea. She caught a flicker of movement from the benches that overlooked the operating arena. The theater had two local greys who always sat in the same places, just a few rows apart, a female mental patient who'd had her ovaries and uterus removed in a hysterectomy in 1926, for which she would have been paid six dollars if she'd survived the procedure, and a male, a medical student. He'd frozen to death in an opium den thousands of miles away, sometime around 1880 but kept returning here to sit in his old seat and look down on whatever passed for life below. Prognostications only happened in the theater four times a year, at the start of each fiscal quarter, but that seemed to be enough to suit him. Darlington liked to say that dealing with ghosts was like riding the subway, do not make eye contact. Do not smile. Do not engage. Otherwise, you never know what might follow you home. Easier said than done when the only other thing to look at in the room was a man playing with another man's innards like they were mahjong tiles. She remembered Darlington's shock when he'd realized she could not only see ghosts without the help of any potion or spell but see them in color. He'd been weirdly furious. She'd enjoyed that. What kinds of color, he'd asked, sliding his feet off the coffee table his heavy black boots thunking on the slatted floor of the parlor at I.L. Bastone. Just color. Like an old Polaroid. Why? What do you see? They look gray, he'd snapped. That's why they're called grays. She'd shrugged, knowing her nonchalance would make Darlington even angrier. It isn't a big deal. Not to you, he'd muttered, and stomped away.
he'd spent the rest of the day in the training room, working up a cranky sweat. She'd felt smug at the time, glad not everything came so easily to him. But now, moving in a circle around the perimeter of the theater, checking the little chalk markings made at every compass point, she just felt jittery and unprepared. That was the way she'd felt since she'd taken her first step. On campus. No, before that. From the time Dean Sando had sat down beside her hospital bed, tapped the handcuffs on her wrist with his nicotine-stained fingers, and said, We are offering you an opportunity. But that was the old Alex. The Alex of Helli and Len. Yale Alex had never worn handcuffs, never gotten into a fight, Never fucked a stranger in a bathroom to make up her boyfriend's vig. Yale Alex struggled but didn't complain. She was a good girl trying to keep up. And failing. She should have been here early to observe the making of the signs and ensure the circle was secure. Grays as old as the ones hovering on the tiered benches above didn't tend to make trouble even when drawn by blood but prognostications were big magic and her job was to verify that the bonesmen followed proper procedures, stayed cautious. She was play-acting, though. She'd spent the previous night cramming, trying to memorize the correct signs and proportions of chalk, charcoal, and bone. She'd made flashcards, for fuck's sake, and forced herself to shuffle through them in between bouts of Joseph Conrad. Alex thought the markings looked okay, but she knew her signs of protection about as well as her modern British novels. When she'd attended the Falk Order prognostication with Darlington, had she really paid attention? No. She'd been too busy sucking on ginger candy, reeling from the strangeness of it all, and praying she wouldn't humiliate herself by puking. She'd thought she had plenty of time to learn with Darlington looking over her shoulder. But they'd both been wrong about that. Vorhoofed, the Harrisbex called, and one of the bonesmen darted forward. Melinda? Miranda? Alex couldn't remember the redhead's name, only that she was in an all-female a cappella group called Whim and Rhythm. The girl patted the Harrisbex's forehead with a white cloth and melted back into the group. Alex tried not to look at the man on the table, but her eyes darted to his face anyway. Michael Reyes? age 48, diagnosed paranoid schizophrenic. Would Reyes remember any of it when he woke? When he tried to tell someone would they just call him crazy? Alex knew exactly what that was like. It could be me on that table. The bonesmen like them as nuts as possible, Darlington had told her. They think it makes for better predictions. When she'd asked him why, he'd just said, the crazier the victima the closer to God. Is that true? It is only through mystery and madness that the soul is revealed, he'd quoted. Then he'd shrugged. Their bank balances say yes. And we're okay with this? Alex had asked Darlington. With people getting cut open so Chauncey can redecorate his summer home? Never met a Chauncey, he'd said. Still hoping. Then he'd paused standing in the armory, his face grave. Nothing is going to stop this. Too many powerful people rely on what the societies can do. Before Lethe existed, no one was keeping watch. So you can make futile bleeding noises in protest and lose your scholarship, or you can stay here, do your job, and do the most good you can. Even then, she'd wondered if that was only part of the story if Darlington's desire to know everything bound him to Lethe just as surely as any sense of duty. But she'd stayed quiet then, and she intended to stay quiet now. Michael Reyes had been found in one of the public beds at Yale New Haven. To the outside world he looked like any other patient, a vagrant, the type who passed through psych wards and emergency rooms and jails, on his meds, then off. He had a brother in New Jersey who was listed as his next of kin and who had signed off on what was supposed to be a routine medical procedure for the treatment of a scarred bowel. Reyes was cared for solely by a nurse named Jean Gatjula, who'd worked three night shifts in a row. She didn't blink or cause a fuss when, 
through what appeared to be a scheduling error, she was slated for two more evenings in the ward. That week her colleagues may or may not have noticed that she always came to work with a huge handbag. In it was stowed a little cooler that she used to carry Michael Reyes's meals, a dove's heart for clarity, geranium root, and a dish of bitter herbs. Gatjula had no idea what the food did or what fate awaited Michael Reyes any more than she knew what became of any of the special patients she tended to. She didn't even know whom she worked for, only that once every month she received a much-needed check to offset the gambling debts her husband racked up at the Foxwoods blackjack tables. Alex wasn't sure if it was her imagination or if she really could smell the ground parsley speckling Reyes's insides, but her own stomach gave another warning flutter. She was desperate for fresh air, sweating beneath. Her layers. The operating theater was kept ice cold, fed by vents separate from the rest of the building, but the huge portable halogens used to light the proceedings still radiated heat. A low moan sounded. Alex's gaze shot to Michael Reyes, a terrible image flashing through her mind, Reyes waking to find himself strapped to a table, surrounded by hooded figures, his insides on the outside. But his eyes were closed, his chest rising and falling in steady rhythm. The moan continued, louder now. Maybe someone else was feeling sick? But none of the bonesmen looked distressed. Their faces glowed like studious moons in the dim theater, eyes trained on the proceedings. Still the moan climbed, a low wind building, churning through the room and bouncing off its dark wood walls. No direct eye contact, Alex warned herself. Just look to see if the greys, she choked back a startled grunt. The greys were no longer in their seats. They leaned over the railing that surrounded the operating theater, fingers gripping the wood, necks craned, their bodies stretching toward the very edge of the chalk circle like animals straining to drink from the lip of a watering hole. Don't look. It was Darlington's voice, his warning. Don't look too closely. It was too easy for a grey to form a bond, to attach itself to you. And it was more dangerous, because she already knew these grey's histories. They had been around so long that generations of Lethe delegates had documented their pasts. But their names had been redacted from all documents. If you don't know a name, Darlington had explained, you can't think it, and then you won't be tempted to say it. A name was a kind of intimacy. Don't look. But Darlington wasn't here. The female Grey was naked, her small breasts puckered from the cold as they must have been in death. She lifted a hand to the open wound of her belly, touched the flesh there fondly, like a woman coyly indicating that she was expecting. They hadn't sewn her up. The boy, and he was a boy, skinny and tender-featured, wore a sloppy bottle-green jacket and stained trousers. Greys always appeared as they had in the moment of death. But there was something obscene about them side by side, one naked, the other clothed. Every muscle in the grey's body strained, their eyes wide and staring, their lips yawning open. The black holes of their mouths were caverns, and from them that bleak keening rose, not really a moan at all, but something flat and inhuman. Alex thought of the wasp's nest she'd found in the garage beneath her mother's Studio City apartment one summer, the mindless buzz of insects in a dark place. The Harrispecs kept reciting in Dutch. Another bonesman held a glass of water to the scribe's lips as he continued his transcriptions. The smell of blood and herbs and shit hung dense in the air. The greys arced forward inch by inch, trembling, lips distended, their mouths too wide now, as if their jaws had unhinged. The whole room seemed to vibrate. But only Alex could see them. That was why Lethe had brought her here why Dean Sando had grudgingly made his golden offer to a girl in handcuffs. Still, Alex looked around, hoping for someone else to understand, for anyone to offer their help. She took a step back, heart rabbiting in her chest. Greys were docile, vague, especially greys this old. At least Alex thought they were. Was this one of the lessons Darlington hadn't gotten to yet? 
she racked her brain for the few incantations Darlington had taught her last semester, spells of protection. She could use death words in a pinch. Would they work on greys in this state? She should have put salt in her pockets, caramels to distract them, anything. Basic stuff, Darlington said in her head. Easy to master. The wood beneath the gray's fingers began to bend and creak. Now the red-headed a capella girl looked up, wondering where the creaking had come from. The wood was going to splinter. The signs must have been made incorrectly. The circle of protection would not hold. Alex looked right and left at the useless bonesmen in their ridiculous robes. If Darlington were here, he would stay and fight, make sure the greys were contained and Reyes was kept safe. The halogens dimmed, surged. Fuck you, Darlington, Alex muttered beneath her breath, already turning on her heel to run. Boom. The room shook. Alex stumbled. The Harrispecs and the rest of the bonesmen looked at her, scowling. Boom. The sound of something knocking from the next world. Something big. Something that should not be let through. Is our Dante drunk? muttered the Harrispecs. Boom. Alex opened her mouth to scream, to tell them to run before whatever was holding that thing back gave way. The moaning dropped away suddenly, completely, as if stoppered in a bottle. The monitor beeped. The lights hummed. The greys were back in their seats, ignoring each other, ignoring her. Beneath her coat, Alex's blouse clung wetly to her, soaked through with sweat. She could smell her own sour fear thick on her skin. The halogen still shone hot and white. The theater pulsed heat like an organ suffused with blood. The bone seamen were staring. Next door, the credits rolled. Alex could see the spot where the greys had gripped the railing, white slivers of wood splayed like corn silk. Sorry, Alex said. She bent at the knees and vomited onto the stone floor. When they finally stitched up Michael Reyes, it was nearly 3 a.m. The Harrispecs and most of the other bonesmen had left hours before to shower off the ritual and prepare for a party that would last well past dawn. The Harrispecs might head directly back to New York in the creamy leather seat of a black town car, or he might stay for the festivities and take his pick of willing undergrad girls or boys or both. She'd been told attending to the Harrispecs was considered an honor, and Alex supposed if you were high enough and drunk enough, it might feel like that was the case, but it sure sounded like being pimped out to the man who paid the bills. The redhead, Miranda, it turned out, like in the Tempest, had helped Alex clean up the vomit. She'd been genuinely nice about it and Alex had almost felt bad for not remembering her name. Reyes had been transported out of the building on a gurney, cloaked in obfuscation veils that made him look like a bunch of AV equipment piled beneath protective plastic sheeting. It was the most risky part of the whole night's endeavor as far as the safety of the society went. Skull and Bones didn't really excel at anything other than prognostication, and of course the members of Manuscript weren't interested in sharing their glamours with another society. The magic binding Reyes's veils wobbled with every bump, the gurney coming into and out of focus, the blips and bleeps from the medical equipment and the ventilator still audible. If anyone stopped to take a close look at what was being wheeled down the hallway, the bonesmen would have some real trouble, though Alex doubted it would be anything they couldn't buy their way out of. She would check in on Reyes once he was back on the ward and then again in a week to make sure he was healing without complications. There had been casualties following prognostications before, though only one since Lethe had been founded in 1898 to monitor the societies. A group of bonesmen had accidentally killed a vagrant during a hastily planned emergency reading after the stock market crash of 1929. Prognostications had been banned for the next four years, and bones had been threatened with the loss of its massive red stone tomb on High Street. That's why we exist. Darlington had said as Alex turned the pages listing the names of each victima and prognostication date in the Lethe records. We are the shepherds, Stern. 
but he'd cringed when Alex pointed to an inscription in one of the margins of Lethe, a legacy. NMDH? No more dead hobos, he'd said on a sigh. So much for the noble mission of Lethe House. Still Alex couldn't feel too superior tonight, not when she'd been seconds from abandoning Michael Reyes to save her own ass. Alex endured a long string of jokes about her spewed dinner of grilled chicken and Twizzlers, and stayed at the theater to make sure the remaining bonesmen followed what she hoped was proper procedure for sanitizing the space. She promised herself she'd return later to sprinkle the theater with bone dust. Reminders of death were the best way to keep greys at bay. It was why cemeteries were some of the least haunted places in the world. She thought of the ghost's open mouths, that horrible drone of insects. Something had been trying to slam its way into the chalk circle. At least that was how it had seemed. Greys, ghosts, were harmless. Mostly. It took a lot for them to take any kind of form in the mortal world. And to pass through the final veil? To become physical, capable of touch? Capable of damage? They could. Alex knew they could. But it was close to impossible. Even so, there had been hundreds of prognostications in this theater, and she'd never heard of any greys crossing over into physical form or interfering. Why had their behavior changed tonight? If it had. The greatest gift Lethe had given Alex was not the full ride to Yale, the new start that had scrubbed her past clean like a chemical burn. It was the knowledge, the certainty, that the things she saw were real and always had been. But she'd lived too long wondering if she was crazy to stop now. Darlington would have believed her. He always had. Except Darlington was gone. Not for good, she told herself. In a week the new moon would rise and they would bring him home. Alex touched her fingers to the cracked railing, already thinking about how to phrase her description of the prognostication for the Lethe house records. Dean Sando reviewed all of them, and she wasn't anxious to draw his attention to anything out of the ordinary. Besides, if you set aside a helpless man having his guts rearranged, nothing bad had actually happened. When Alex emerged from the passage into the hallway, Trip Helmuth startled from his slouch. They almost done in there? Alex nodded and took a deep breath of comparatively fresh air, eager to get outside. Pretty gross, huh? Trip asked with a smirk. If you want I can slip you some of the tips when they get transcribed. Take the edge off those student loans. What the fuck would you know about student loans? The words were out before she could stop them. Darlington would not approve. Alex was supposed to remain civil, distant, diplomatic. And anyway, she was a hypocrite. Lethe had made sure she would graduate without a cloud of debt. Hanging over her, if she actually made it through four years of exams and papers and nights like these. Trip held his hands up in surrender, laughing uneasily. Hey, just trying to get by. Trip was on the sailing team, a third-generation bones man, a gentleman and a scholar, a purebred golden retriever, dopey, glossy, and expensive. He was rumpled and rosy as a healthy infant, his hair sandy, his skin still tan from whichever island he'd spent winter break on. He had the ease of someone who had always been and would always be just fine, a boy of a thousand second chances. We good, he asked eagerly. We're good, she said, though she was not good at all. She could still feel the reverberation of that buzzing moan filling up her lungs, rattling the inside of her skull. Just stuffy in there. Right? Tripp said, ready to be pals. Maybe getting stuck out here all night's not so bad. He didn't sound convinced. What happened to your arm? Alex could see a bit of bandage peeking out from Tripp's windbreaker. He shoved the sleeve up revealing a patch of greasy cellophane taped over the inside of his forearm. A bunch of us got tattoos today. Alex looked closer, a strutting bulldog bursting through a big blue Y. 
the dude bro equivalent of best friends for Eva. Nice, she lied. You got any ink? His sleepy eyes roved over her, trying to peel back the winter layers, no different than the losers who had hung around ground zero, fingers brushing her clavicle, her biceps, tracing the shapes there. So what does this one mean? Nope. Not my thing. Alex wrapped her scarf around her neck. I'll check in on Reyes on the ward tomorrow. Huh? Oh, right. Good. Where's Darlington anyway? He already sticking you with the shit jobs? Trip tolerated Alex, tried to be friendly with her because he wanted his belly rubbed by everyone he encountered, but he genuinely liked Darlington. Spain, she said, because that was what she'd been instructed to say. Nice. Tell him buenos dias. If Alex could have told Darlington anything, it would have been, come back. She would have said it in English and Spanish. She would have used the imperative. Adios, she said to Trip. Enjoy the party. Once she was clear of the building, Alex yanked off her gloves and unwrapped two sticky ginger candies, shoving them into her mouth. She was tired of thinking about Darlington, but the smell of the ginger, the heat it created at the back of her throat, brought him even more brightly alive. She saw his long body sprawled in front of the great stone fireplace at Black Elm. He'd taken his boots off, left his socks to dry on the hearth. He was on his back, eyes closed, head resting in the cradle of his arms, toes wiggling in time to the music floating around the room, something classical Alex didn't know, dense with French horns that left emphatic crescents of sound in the air. Alex had been on the floor beside him, arms clasped around her knees, back pressed against the base of an old sofa, trying to seem relaxed and to stop staring at his feet. They just looked so naked. He'd cuffed his black jeans up, keeping the damp off his skin, and those slender white feet, hair dusting the toes, had made her feel a little obscene, like some sepia-toned pervert driven mad by a glimpse of ankle. Fuck you, Darlington. She yanked her gloves back on. For a moment she stood paralyzed. She should get back to Lethe House and write up her report for Dean Sando to review, but what she really wanted was to flop down on the narrow bottom bunk of the room she shared with Mercy and cram in all the sleep she could before class. At this hour, she wouldn't have to make any excuses to curious roommates. But if she slept at Lethe, Mercy and Lauren would be clamoring to know where and with whom she'd spent the night. Darlington had suggested making up a boyfriend to justify her long absences and late nights. If I do that, at some point I'll have to produce a boy-shaped human to gaze at me adoringly, Alex had replied in frustration. How have you gotten away with this for the last three years? Darlington had just shrugged. My roommates figured I was a player. If Alex's eyes had rolled back in her head any farther, she would have been facing the opposite direction. All right, all right. I told them I was in a band with some Yukon guys and that we played out a lot. Do you even play an instrument? Of course. Cello, upright bass, guitar, piano, and something called a nude. Hopefully, Mercy would be fast asleep when Alex got back to the room and she could slip inside to retrieve her basket of shower things and head down the hall without notice. It would be tricky. Any time you tampered with the veil between this world and the next, it left a stink that was something like the electrical crackle of ozone after a storm coupled with the rot of a pumpkin left too long on a windowsill. The first time she'd made the mistake of returning to the suite without showering, she'd actually had to lie about slipping in a pile of garbage to explain it. Mercy and Lauren had laughed about it for weeks. Alex thought of the grimy shower waiting at her dorm, and then of sinking into the vast old clawfoot tub in Ayel Bastone's spotless bathroom, the four-poster bed so high she had to hoist herself onto it. Supposedly Lethe had safe houses and hidey holes all over the Yale campus but the two Alex had been introduced to were the Hutch and I.L. Bastone. The Hutch was closer to Alex's dorm and most of her classes, but it was just a shabby, 
comfortable set of rooms above a clothing store, always stocked with bags of chips and Darlington's protein bars, a place to stop in and take a quick nap on the badly sprung couch. I.L. Bastone was something special, a three-story mansion nearly a mile from the heart of campus that served as Lethe's main headquarters. Oculus would be waiting there tonight, the lamps lit, with a tray of tea, brandy, and sandwiches. It was tradition, even if Alex didn't show up to enjoy them. But the price of all that luxury would be dealing with Oculus, and she just couldn't handle Dawes's clenched jaw silences tonight. Better to return to the dorms with the stink of the night's work on her. Alex crossed the street and cut back through the rotunda. It was hard not to keep looking behind her, thinking of the greys standing at the edge of the circle with their mouths stretched too wide, black pits humming that low insect sound. What would have happened if that railing had broken, if the chalk circle hadn't held? What had provoked them? Would she have had the strength or the knowledge to hold them off? Pasa punto, pasa mundo. Alex pulled her coat tighter, tucking her face into her scarf, her breath humid against the wool, hurrying back past Beinecke Library. If you get locked in there during a fire, all of the oxygen gets sucked out, Lauren had claimed. To protect the books. Alex knew that was bullshit. Darlington had told her so. He'd known the truth of the building, all of its faces, that it had been built to the platonic ideal, the building was a temple employing the same ratios used by some typesetters for their pages, the building was a book, that its marble had been quarried in Vermont, the building was a monument. The entrance had been created so that only one person was permitted to enter at a time, passing through the rotating door like a supplicant. She remembered Darlington pulling on the white gloves worn to handle rare manuscripts, his long fingers resting reverently on the page. It was the same way Len handled cash. There was a room in Beinecke, hidden on, she couldn't remember which floor. And even if she could have she wouldn't have gone. She didn't have the balls to descend into the patio, touch her fingers to the window in the secret pattern, enter in the dark. This place had been dear to Darlington. There was no place more magical. There was no place on campus she felt more like a fraud. Alex reached for her phone to check the time, hoping it wasn't much past three. If she could get washed up and into bed by four, she'd still be able to get three and a half solid hours before she had to be up and across campus again for Spanish. This was the math she ran every night, every moment. How much time to try to get the work done? How much time to rest? She could never quite make the numbers work. She was just scraping by, stretching the budget, always coming up a little short, and the panic clung to her, dogging her steps. Alex looked at the glowing screen and swore. It was flooded with messages. She'd put the phone on silent for the prognostication and forgotten to switch it back on. The texts were all from the same person, Oculus, Pamela Dawes, the grad student who maintained the Lethe residences and served as their research assistant. Pammy, though only Darlington called her that. Call in. The texts were all timed exactly fifteen minutes apart. Either Dawes was following some kind of protocol or she was even more uptight than Alex had thought. Alex considered just ignoring the messages. But it was a Thursday night, the night the societies met and that meant that some little shit had gotten up to something bad. For all she knew, the shape-shifting idiots at Wolf's Head had turned themselves into a herd of buffalo and trampled a bunch of students coming out of Branford. She stepped behind one of the columns supporting the Beinecke cube to shelter from the wind and dialed. Dawes picked up on the first ring. Oculus speaking. Dante replies, Alex said, feeling like a jackass. She was Dante. Darlington was Virgil. That was the way Lethe was supposed to work until Alex made it to her senior year and took on the title of Virgil to mentor an incoming freshman. She'd nodded and matched Darlington's small smile when he'd told her their code names, he'd referred to them as offices, pretending she got the joke. Later, 
she'd looked them up and discovered that Virgil had been Dante's guide as he descended into hell. More Lethe house humor wasted on her. There's a body at Payne Whitney, said Dawes. Centurion is on sight. A body, Alex repeated, wondering if fatigue had damaged her ability to understand basic human speech. Yes. Like a dead body? Ye yes. Dawes was clearly trying to sound calm, but her breath caught, turning the single syllable into a musical hiccup. Alex pressed her back against the column, the cold of the stone seeping through her coat, and felt a stab of angry adrenaline spike through her. Are you messing with me? That was what she wanted to ask. That was what this felt like. Being fucked with. Being the weird kid who talked to herself, who was so desperate for friends she agreed when Sarah McKinney pleaded, Can you meet me at Trace Machachos after school? I want to see if you can talk to my grandma. We used to go there a lot, and I miss her so much. The kid who stood outside the shittiest Mexican restaurant in the shittiest food court in the valley by herself until she had to call her mom to ask her to pick her up because no one was coming. Of course no one was coming. This is real, she reminded herself. And Pamela Dawes was a lot of things, but she wasn't a Sarah McKinney-style asshole. Which meant someone was dead. And she was supposed to do something about it? Uh, was it an accident? Possible homicide. Dawes sounded like she'd been waiting for just this question. Okay, Alex said, because she had no idea what else to say. Okay. Dawes replied awkwardly. She delivered her big line, and now she was ready to get off stage. Alex hung up and stood in the bleak, windswept silence of the empty plaza. She'd forgotten at least half of what Darlington had tried to teach her before he'd vanished, but he definitely hadn't covered murder. She didn't know why. If you were going to hell together, murder seemed like a good place to start. 2. Last Fall Daniel Arlington prided himself on being prepared for anything, but if he'd had to choose a way to describe Alex Stern, it would have been an unwelcome surprise. He could think of a lot of other terms for her, but none of them were polite, and Darlington always endeavored to be polite. If he'd been brought up by his parents, his dilettante father, his glib but brilliant mother, he might have had different priorities, but he'd been raised by his grandfather, Daniel Tabor Arlington III, who believed that most problems could be solved with cask-strength scotch, plenty of ice, and impeccable manners. His grandfather had never met Galaxy Stern. Darlington sought out Alex's first-floor Vanderbilt dorm room on a sweating, miserable day in the first week of September. He could have waited for her to report to the house on Orange, but when he was a freshman, his own mentor, the inimitable Michelle Alamedin, who had served as his Virgil, had welcomed him to Yale and the mysteries of Lethe House by coming to meet him at the old campus freshman dorms. Darlington was determined to do things right, even if everything about the Stern situation had started out wrong. He hadn't chosen Galaxy Stern as his Dante. In fact, she had, by sheer virtue of her existence, robbed him of something he'd been looking forward to for the entirety of his three-year tenure with Lethe the moment when he would gift someone new with the job he loved, when he'd crack the ordinary world open for some worthy but barely suspecting soul. Only a few months before, he'd unloaded the boxes full of incoming freshmen. Applications and stacked them in the great room at Black Elm, giddy with excitement, determined to read or at least skim through all 1800-plus files before he made his recommendations to the Lethe House alumni. He would be fair, open-minded, and thorough, and in the end he would choose twenty candidates for the role of Dante. Then Lethe would vet their backgrounds, check for health risks, signs of mental illness, and financial vulnerabilities, and a final decision would be made. Darlington had created a plan for how many applications he'd have to tackle each day that would still free his mornings for work on the estate and his afternoons for his job at the Peabody Museum. He'd been ahead of schedule that day in July, on application number 324, Mackenzie Hoffer, 800 verbal, 
720 math, 9 APs her junior year, blog on the Bayou Tapestry maintained in both English and French. She'd seemed promising until he'd gotten to her personal essay, in which she compared herself to Emily Dickinson. Darlington had just tossed her folder onto the no pile when Dean Sando called to tell him their search was over. They'd found their candidate. The alumni were unanimous. Darlington had wanted to protest. Hell, he'd wanted to break something. Instead, he'd straightened the stack of folders before him and said, Who is it? I have all of the files right here. You don't have her file. She never applied. She didn't even finish high school. Before Darlington could sputter his indignation, Sando added, Daniel, she can see Grays. Darlington had paused, his hand still atop Mackenzie Hoffer, two summers with Habitat for Humanity. It wasn't just the sound of his given name, something Sando rarely used. She can see Grays. The only way for one of the living to see the dead was by ingesting the Orat Sirio, an elixir of infinite complexity that required perfect skill and attention to detail to create. He'd attempted it himself when he was seventeen, before he'd ever heard of Lethe, when he'd only hoped there might be more to this world than he'd been led to believe. His efforts had landed him in the ER and he'd hemorrhaged blood from his ears and eyes for two days. She managed to brew an elixir, he said, both thrilled and, he could admit it, a little jealous. Silence followed, long enough for Darlington to switch off the light on his grandfather's desk and walk out to the back porch of Black Elm. From here he could see the gentle slope of houses leading down Edgewood to campus and, far beyond, the Long Island Sound. All of the land down to Central Avenue had once been a part of Black Elm, but had been sold off in bits and pieces as the Arlington fortune dwindled. The house, its rose gardens, and the ruined mess of the maze at the edge of the wood were all that remained, and only he remained to tend and prune and coddle it back to life. Dusk was falling now, a long, slow summer twilight, thick with mosquitoes and the glint of fireflies. He could see the question mark of Cosmo's white tail as the cat wended his way through the high grass, stalking some small creature. No elixir, said Sando. She can just see them. Ah, said Darlington, watching a thrush peck half-heartedly at the broken base of what had once been the obelisk fountain. There was nothing else to say. Though Lethe had been created to monitor the activities of Yale's secret societies, its secondary mission was to unravel the mysteries of what lay beyond the veil. For years they had documented stories of people who could actually see phantoms, some confirmed, some little more than rumor. So if the board had found a girl who could do these things, and they could make her beholden to them. Well, that was that. He should be glad to meet her. He wanted to get drunk. I'm not any happier about this than you are, said Sando but you know the position we're in. This is an important year for Lethe. We need everyone happy. Lethe was responsible for keeping watch over the houses of the Vale, but it also relied on them for funding. This was a re-up year and the societies had gone so long without an incident. There were rumblings that perhaps they shouldn't dip into their coffers to continue supporting Lethe at all. I'll send you her files. She's not. She's not the Dante we might have hoped for, but try to keep an open mind. Of course, said Darlington, because that was what a gentleman did. Of course I will. He'd tried to mean it. Even after he read her file, even after he'd watched the interview between her and Sando recorded at a hospital in Van Nuys, California, heard the husky, broken woodwind sound of her voice, he'd tried. She'd been found naked and comatose at a crime scene, next to a girl who hadn't been lucky enough to survive the fentanyl they'd both taken. The details of it were all more sordid and sad than he could have fathomed, and he'd tried to feel sorry for her. His Dante, the girl he would gift with the keys to a secret world, was a criminal, a drug user, a dropout who cared about none of the things he did. But he'd tried. 
and still nothing had prepared him for the shock of her presence in that shabby Vanderbilt common room. The room was small but high-ceilinged, with three tall windows that looked out onto the horseshoe-shaped courtyard and two narrow doors leading to the bedrooms. The space eddied with the easy chaos of a freshman year move-in, boxes on the floor, no proper furniture to be seen, but a wobbly lamp and a battered recliner pushed up against the long-since functional fireplace. A muscular blonde in running shorts, Lauren, he guessed, likely pre-med, solid test scores, field hockey captain at her Philadelphia prep school, was setting up a faux-vintage turntable on the ledge of the window seat, a plastic crate of records balanced beside it. The recliner was probably hers too, carted along in a moving truck from Bucks County to New Haven. Anna Breen, Huntsville, Texas, STEM scholarship, choir leader, sat on the floor trying to assemble what looked like a bookshelf. This was a girl who would never quite fit. She'd end up in a singing group or maybe get heavily into her church. She definitely wouldn't be partying with her other roommates. Then the other two girls shuffled out of one of the bedrooms, awkwardly hefting a banged-up university-issued desk between them. Do you have to put that out here? asked Anna glumly. We need more space, said a girl in a flowered sundress Darlington knew was Mercy Zhao, piano, 800 math, 800 verbal, prize-winning essays on Rabelais and a bizarre but compelling comparison of a passage in The Sound and the Fury to a bit about a pear tree in the Canterbury Tales that had garnered the notice of both the Yale and Princeton English departments. And then Galaxy Stern, no high school diploma, no GED, no achievements to speak of other than surviving her own misery, emerged from the dark nook of the bedroom, dressed in a long-sleeved shirt and black jeans totally inappropriate to the heat and balancing one end of the desk in her skinny arms. The low quality of Sando's video had caught the slick, straight sheaves of her black hair but not the severe precision of her center part, the hollow quality of her eyes but not the deep ink blot of their color. She looked malnourished, her clavicles sharp as exclamation points beneath the fabric of her shirt. She was too sleek, almost damp, less undine rising from the waters than a dagger-toothed rusalka. Or maybe she just needed a snack and a long nap. All right, Stern. Let's begin. Darlington rapped on the door, stepped into the room, smiled big, bright, welcoming as they set the desk down in the common room corner. Alex. Your mom told me I should check in on you. It's me, Darlington. For a brief moment she looked utterly lost, even panicked, then she matched his smile. Hey. I didn't recognize you. Good. She was adaptable. Introductions, please, said Lauren, her gaze interested, assessing. She'd pulled a copy of Queen's A Day at the races from the crate. He extended his hand. I'm Darlington, Alex's cousin. Are you in J.E. too? Lauren asked. Darlington remembered that unearned sense of loyalty. At the start of the year, all the incoming freshmen were sorted into residential colleges where they would eat most of their meals and where they would eventually sleep when they left old campus behind as sophomores. They would buy scarves striped in their residential college colors, learn the college's chants and mottos. Alex belonged to Lethe, just as Darlington had, but she'd been assigned to Jonathan Edwards, named for the fire and brimstone preacher. I'm in Davenport, Darlington said. But I don't live on campus. He'd liked living in Davenport, the dining hall, the big grassy courtyard. But he didn't like Black Elm sitting empty and the money he'd saved on his room and board had been enough to fix the water damage he'd found in the ballroom last spring. Besides, Cosmo liked the company. Do you have a car? asked Lauren. Mercy laughed. Oh my God, you're ridiculous. Lauren shrugged. How else are we going to get to Ikea? We need a couch. She would be the leader of this crew, the one who'd suggest which parties to go to who'd have them host a room for liquor treat at Halloween. Sorry, he said with an apologetic smile. I can't drive you. 
at least not today. Or any day. And I need to steal Alex away. Alex wiped her palms on her jeans. We're trying to get settled, she said hesitantly, hopefully even. He could see circles of sweat blooming beneath her arms. You made a promise, he said with a wink. And you know how my mom gets about family stuff. He saw a flash of rebellion in her oil slick eyes, but all she said was, Okay. Can you give us cash for the couch? Lauren asked Alex, roughly shoving the Queen record back into the crate. He hoped it wasn't the original vinyl. You bet, said Alex. She turned to Darlington. Aunt Eileen said she'd spring for a new couch, right? Darlington's mother's name was Harper, and he doubted she even knew the word Ikea, did she really? Alex crossed her arms. Yup. Darlington took his wallet from his back pocket and peeled off three hundred dollars in cash. He handed it to Alex, who passed it to Lauren. Make sure you write her a thank you note, he said. Oh, I will, said Alex. I know she's a real stickler for that kind of thing. When they were striding across the lawns of old campus, the red brick towers and crenellations of Vanderbilt behind them, Darlington said, You owe me three hundred dollars. I'm not buying you a couch. You can afford it, Alex said coolly. I'm guessing you come from the good side of the family, cuz. You needed cover for why you're going to be off seeing me so much. Bullshit. You were testing me. It's my job to test you. I thought it was your job to teach me. That's not the same thing. At least she wasn't stupid. Fair enough. But visits to dear Aunt Eileen can cover a few of your late nights. How late are we talking about? He could hear the worry in her voice. Was it caution or laziness? How much did Dean Sander tell you? Not much. She pulled the fabric of her shirt away from her stomach, trying to cool herself. Why are you dressed like that? He hadn't meant to ask, but she looked uncomfortable, her black Henley button to the neck sweat spreading in dark rings from her armpits, and completely out of place. A girl who managed lies so smoothly should have a better sense of protective cover. Alex just slid him a sideways look. I'm very modest. Darlington had no reply to that, so he pointed to one of the two identical red brick buildings, bracketing the path. This is the oldest building on campus. It doesn't look old. It's been well maintained. It almost didn't make it, though. People thought it ruined the look of old campus, so they wanted to knock it down. Why didn't they? The books credit a preservation campaign, but the truth is Lethe discovered the building was load bearing. Huh? Spiritually load bearing. It was part of an old binding ritual to keep the campus safe. They turned right down a path that would lead them toward the ersatz medieval portcullis of Phelps Gate. That's what the whole college used to look like. Little buildings of red bricks. Colonial. A lot like Harvard. Then after the Civil War, the walls went up. Now most of the campus is built that way, a series of fortresses, walled and gated, a castle keep. Old campus was a perfect example a massive quadrangle of towering stone dorms surrounding a huge sun-dappled courtyard welcome to all, until night fell and the gates banged shut. Why? Alex asked. To keep the rabble out. The soldiers came back to New Haven from the war wild, most of them unmarried, a lot of them messed up from the fighting. There was a wave of immigration too. Irish, Italians, freed slaves, everyone looking for manufacturing jobs. Yale didn't want any of it. Alex laughed. Is something funny? he asked. She glanced back at her dorm. Mercy's Chinese. A Nigerian girl lives next door. Then there's my mongrel ass. We all got in anyway. Eventually. A long slow siege. The word mongrel felt like dangerous bait. He took in her black hair, her black eyes, 
the olive cast of her skin. She might have been Greek, Mexican, white, Jewish mother, no mention of a father, but I assume you had one? Never knew him. There was more here, but he wasn't going to push. We all have spaces we keep blank. They'd reached Phelps Gate, the big echoing archway that led onto College Street and away from the relative safety of old campus. He didn't want to get sidetracked. They had too much literal and figurative ground to cover. This is the New Haven Green, he said, as they strode down one of the stone paths when the colony was founded, this was where they built their meeting house. The town was meant to be a new Eden, founded between two rivers like the Tigris and the Euphrates. Alex frowned. Why so many churches? There were three on the green, two of them near twins in their federal design, the third a jewel of Gothic revival. This town has a church for nearly every block. Or it used to. Some of them are closing now. People just don't go. Do you? she asked. Do you? Nope. Yes, I go, he said. It's a family thing. He saw the flicker of judgment in her eyes, but he didn't need to explain. Church on Sunday, work on Monday. That was the Arlington way. When Darlington had turned thirteen and protested that he'd be happy to risk God's wrath if he could just sleep in, his grandfather seized him by the ear and dragged him out of bed despite his eighty years. I don't care what you believe, he'd said. The working man believes in God and expects us to do the same, so you will get your ass dressed and in a pew or I will tan it raw. Darlington had gone. And after his grandfather had died, he kept going. The green is the site of the city's first church and its first graveyard. It's a source of tremendous power. Yeah, no shit. He realized her shoulders had gone loose and easy. Her stride had changed. She looked a little less like someone gearing up to take a swing. Darlington tried not to sound too eager. What do you see? She didn't answer. I know about what you can do. It isn't a secret. Alex's gaze was still distant, almost disinterested. It's empty here, that's all. I never really see much around cemeteries and stuff. And stuff. Darlington looked around, but all he saw was what everyone else would, students, people who worked at the courthouse or the string of shops along chapel, enjoying the sun on their lunch hour. He knew the paths that seemed to bisect the green arbitrarily had been drawn by a group of Freemasons to try to appease and contain the dead when the cemetery had been moved a few blocks away. He knew that their compass lines, or a pentagram, depending on whom you asked, could be seen from above. He knew the spot where the Lincoln Oak had toppled after Hurricane Sandy, revealing a human skeleton tangled in its roots, one of the many bodies never moved to Grove Street Cemetery. He saw the city differently because he knew it, and his knowledge was not casual. It was adoration. But no amount of love could make him see greys. Not without Orotsirio, another hit from the Golden Bull. He shuddered. Every time was a risk, another chance that his body would say enough, that one of his kidneys would simply fail. It makes sense you don't see them here, he said. Certain things will draw them to graveyards and cemeteries, but as a rule, they steer clear. Now he had her attention. Real interest sparked in her eyes, the first indication of something beyond watchful reserve. Why? Gray's love life and anything that reminds them of being alive. Salt, sugar, sweat. Fighting and fucking, tears and blood and human drama. I thought salt kept them out. Darlington raised a brow. Did you see that on television? Would it make you happier if I say I learned it from an ancient book? Actually, yes. Too bad. Salt is a purifier, he said as they crossed Temple Street, so it's good for banishing demons, though to my great sorrow I've never personally had the honor. But when it comes to greys, 
making a salt circle is the equivalent of leaving a salt lick for deer. So what keeps them out? Her need crackled through the words. So this was where her interest lay. Bone dust. Graveyard dirt. The leavings of crematory ash. Memento. Mori. He glanced at her. Any Latin? She shook her head. Of course not. They hate reminders of death. If you want to grayproof your room, hang a Holbein print. He'd meant it as a joke, but he could see she was chewing on what he'd said, committing the artist's name to memory. Darlington felt an acute twinge of guilt that he did not enjoy. He'd been so busy envying this girl's ability, he hadn't considered what it might be like if you could never close the door on the dead. I can ward your room, he said by way of penance. Your whole dorm, if you like. You can do that? Yes, he said. And I can show you how to do it too. Tell me the rest, said Alex. Away from the dim cavern of the dorms, sweat had formed in a slick sheen over her nose and forehead, gathering in the divot above her upper lip. She was going to soak that shirt, and he could see she was self-conscious about it by the way she held her arms rigidly to her sides. Did you read The Life of Lethe? Yes. Really? I skimmed it. Read it, he said. I've made you a list of other material that will help get you up to speed. Mostly histories of New Haven and our own compiled history of the societies. Alex gave a sharp shake of her head. I mean tell me what I'm in for here, with you. That was a hard question to answer. Nothing. Everything. Lethe was meant to be a gift, but could it be to her? There was too much to tell. They left the green and he saw tension snap back into her shoulders, though there was still nothing his eyes could see to warrant it. They passed the row of banks clustered along Elm, looming over Cababians, the little red rug store that had somehow thrived in New Haven for over one hundred years, then turned left up orange. They were only a few blocks from campus proper now, but it felt like miles. The bustle of student life vanished, as if stepping into the city was like falling off a cliff. The streets were a mess of new and old, gently weathered townhouses, barren parking lots, a carefully restored concert hall, the gargantuan high rise of the housing authority. Why here? Alex asked when Darlington didn't answer her previous question. What is it about this place that draws them? The short answer was who knows. But Darlington doubted that would cast him or Lethe in the most credible light. In the early 1800s, magic was moving from the old world to the new, leaving Europe along with its practitioners. They needed some place to store their knowledge and preserve its practices. No one's certain why New Haven worked. They tried in other places too, Darlington said with some pride. Cambridge. Princeton. New Haven was where the magic caught and held and took root. Some people think it's because the veil is thinner here, easier to pierce. You can see why Lethe is happy to have you on board. At least, some of Lethe. You may be able to offer us answers. There are greys that have been here far longer than the university. And these practitioners thought it would be smart to teach all this magic to a bunch of college kids? Contact with the uncanny takes a toll. The older you get, the harder it is to endure that contact. So each year, the societies replenish the supply with a new tap, a new delegation. Magic is quite literally a dying art and New Haven is one of the few places in the world where it can still be brought to life. She said nothing. Was she scared? Good. Maybe she would actually read the books he assigned instead of skimming them. There are over a hundred societies at Yale at this point, but we don't concern ourselves with most of them. They get together for dinners, tell their life stories, do a little community service. It's the ancient eight that matter the landed societies. The houses of the Vale. They're the ones that have held their tombs continuously. Tombs? 
I'm betting you've already seen some of them. Clubhouses, though they look more like mausoleums. Why don't we care about the other societies? she asked. We care about power, and power is linked to place. Each of the houses of the Vale grew up around a branch of the arcane and is devoted to studying it, and each built their tomb over a nexus of power. Except for Brasilius, and no one cares about Brasilius. They'd founded their society in direct response to the growing magical presence in New Haven, claiming the other houses were charlatans and superstitious dilettantes dedicating themselves to investments in new technologies and the philosophy that the only true magic was science. They'd managed to survive the stock market crash of 1929 without the help of prognostication, and limped along until the crash of 1987 when they'd been all but wiped out. As it happened, the only true magic was magic. A nexus, Alex repeated. They're all over campus? The nexus. Nexuses. Think of magic like a river. The nexuses are where the power eddies, and it's what allows the society's rituals to function successfully. We've mapped twelve in the city. Tombs have been built on eight of them. The others are on sites where structures already exist, like the train station, and where it would be impossible to build. A few societies have lost their tombs over time they can study all they want. Once that connection is broken, they don't accomplish much. And you're telling me this has all been going on for more than a hundred years and no one has figured it out? The ancient eight have yielded some of the most powerful men and women in the world. People who literally steer governments, the wealth of nations, who forge the shape of culture. They've run everything from the United Nations to Congress to the New York Times to the World Bank. They've fixed nearly every World Series, six Super Bowls, the Academy Awards, and at least one presidential election. Hundreds of websites are dedicated to unraveling their connections to the Freemasons, the Illuminati, the Bilderberg Group, the list goes on. Maybe if they met at Denny's instead of giant mausoleums, they wouldn't have to worry about that. They had arrived at I.L. Bastone, Lethe House, three stories of red brick and stained glass, built by John Anderson in 1882 for an outrageous sum and then abandoned barely a year later. He claimed he was being chased out by the city's high tax rates. Lethe's records told a different story, one that involved his father and the ghost of a dead cigar girl. I.L. Bastone didn't sprawl like Black Elm. It was a city house bracketed closely on both sides by other properties, tall but contained in its grandeur. They're not worried, said Darlington. They welcome all of the conspiracy theories and tinfoil hat-wearing loons. Because they like feeling interesting? Because what they're really doing is so much worse. Darlington pushed open the black wrought iron gate and saw the porch of the old house straighten slightly, as if in anticipation. After you. As soon as the gate shut, darkness enveloped them. From somewhere beneath the house, a howl sounded, high and hungry. Galaxy Stern had asked what she was in for. It was time to show her. 3. Winter. Who dies at the gym? After her call with Dawes, Alex backtracked across the plaza. She had been to Payne Whitney Gymnasium exactly once when she'd let Mercy drag her to a salsa class, where a white girl snugly packed into top black pants had told her to pivot, pivot, pivot. Darlington had encouraged her to use the free weights and to build up her cardio. For what? Alex had asked. To better yourself. Only Darlington could say something like that with a straight face. But, then again, he ran six miles every morning and swept into rooms on a cloud of physical perfection. Every time he showed up at the Vanderbilt suite, it was as if someone had run an electric current through the floor. Lauren, Mercy, even silent, frowning Anna, would sit up a little straighter, looking bright-eyed and slightly frantic as a bunch of well-groomed squirrels. Alex would have liked to be immune to it, the pretty face, his lean frame the easy way he occupied space as if he owned it. 
he had a way of distractedly brushing the brown hair back from his forehead that made you want to do it for him. But Darlington's lure was offset by the healthy fear he instilled in her. At the end of the day, he was a rich boy in a nice coat who could capsize her without even meaning to. That first day at the mansion on Orange, he'd set jackals on her. Jackals. He'd given a sharp whistle and they'd leapt from the bushes near the house, snarling and cackling. Alex had screamed. Her legs had tangled as she'd turned to run and she'd fallen to the grass, nearly impaling herself on the low iron fence. But early on in her time with Len she'd learned to always watch the person in charge. That changed from room to room, house to house, deal to deal, but it always paid to know who could make the big decisions. That was Darlington. And Darlington didn't look scared. He looked interested. The jackals were stalking toward her, slavering, teeth bared and backs bent. They looked like foxes. They looked like the coyotes that ran the Hollywood Hills. They looked like hounds. We are the shepherds. Darlington, she said, forcing calm into her voice. Call off your fucking dogs. He'd spoken a series of words she didn't understand and the creatures had slunk back into the bushes, all of their aggression vanishing, bouncing on their paws and nipping at one another's heels. He'd had the gall to smile at her as he offered her an elegant hand. The Van Nuys girl inside her longed to slap it away, jab her fingers into his windpipe, and make him sorry. But she forced herself to take his hand, let him help her up. It had been the start of a very long day. When Alex had finally returned home to the dorms, Lauren waited all of sixty seconds before pouncing with, So does your cousin have a girlfriend? They were sitting around the new coffee table, trying to get its legs not to wobble as they pushed in little plastic screws. Anna had vanished off somewhere and Lauren had ordered pizza. The window was open, letting in the bare beginnings of a breeze as twilight fell, and Alex felt like she was watching herself from the courtyard, a happy girl, a normal girl, surrounded by people with futures who assumed she had a future too. She had wanted to hold on to that feeling, to keep it for herself. You know, I have no idea. She'd been so overwhelmed she hadn't had a chance to be curious. He smells like money, said Mercy. Lauren threw an Allen wrench at her. Tacky. Don't start dating my cousin, Alex said, because that was the kind of thing these girls said. I don't need that mess. On this night, with the wind clawing to get into her winter coat, Alex thought of that girl, illuminated in gold, sitting in that sacred circle. It was the last moment of peace she could remember. Only five months had passed, but it felt much longer. She cut left, shadowed by the white columns that ran along the south side of the vast dining hall that everyone still called Commons, though it was supposed to be the Schwartzman Center now. Schwartzman was a bones man, class of 1969, and had managed a notoriously successful private equity fund, the Blackstone Group. The center was the result of a $150 million donation to the university, a gift, and a kind of apology for stray magic that had escaped an unsanctioned ritual and caused bizarre behavior and seizures in half the members of the Yale Precision Marching Band during a football game with Dartmouth. Alex thought of the greys in the operating theater, mouths gaping. It had been a routine prognostication. Nothing should have gone wrong, but something most definitely had, even if she was the only one who knew it. And now she was supposed to contend with a murder? She knew Darlington and Dawes had kept an eye on homicides in the New Haven area, just to make sure there was no stink of the uncanny, no chance one of the societies had gotten overeager and stepped beyond the bounds of their rituals. Ahead of her, Grace formed a thin gruel that shifted over the roof of the law school, spreading and curling like milk poured into coffee, drawn by the grind of fear and ambition. Book and Snake's towering white tomb loomed on her right. Of all the society buildings, it was the most like a crypt. Greek pediment, ionic columns. Pedestrian stuff, Darlington had said. 
he saved his admiration for the Moorish screens and scrollwork of scroll and key, the severe mid-century lines of manuscript. But it was the fence surrounding book and snake that always drew Alex's eye, black iron crawling with snakes. The symbol of Mercury, god of commerce, Darlington had said. God of thieves. Even Alex knew that one. Mercury was the messenger. Ahead of her lay Grove Street Cemetery. Alex glimpsed a cluster of greys gathered by a grave near the entrance. Someone had probably left cookies for a lost relative or something sugary as a fan offering for one of the artists or architects buried there. But the rest of the cemetery, like all cemeteries at night, was empty of ghosts. During the day, greys were called to the salt tears and fragrant flowers of mourners, gifts from the living left for the dead. She'd learned they loved anything that reminded them of life. The spilled beer and raucous laughter of frat parties, the libraries at exam time, dense with anxiety, coffee, and open cans of sweet, syrupy coke, dorm room staticky with gossip, panting couples, mini fridges stuffed with food going to rot, students tossing in their sleep, dreams full of sex and terror. That's where I should be, Alex thought, in the dorm showering in the grimy bathroom, not walking by a graveyard in the dead of night. The cemetery gates had been built to look like an Egyptian temple, their fat columns carved with lotus blossoms, the plinth emblazoned with giant letters, the dead shall be raised. Darlington called the period at the end of that sentence the most eloquent piece of punctuation in the English language. Another thing Alex had been forced to look up, another bit of code to decipher. It turned out the quote was from a Bible verse. Behold, I show you a mystery, we shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet shall sound, and the dead shall be raised incorruptible, and we shall be changed. Incorruptible. When she saw that word she understood Darlington's smirk. The dead would be raised, but as for incorruptibility, Grove Street Cemetery was making no promises. In New Haven, it was best not to hope for guarantees. The scene in front of Payne Whitney Gym reminded Alex of the operating theater, police floodlights illuminating the snow, throwing the shadows of onlookers against the ground in stark lines. It would have been beautiful, carved in white and black like a lithograph, but the effect was ruined by barriers of yellow tape and the lazy, rhythmic whirl of blue and red from patrol cars that had been parked to block off the intersection where the two streets conjoined. The activity seemed to be focused on the triangle of orphaned land at its center. Alex could see a coroner's van with its bay doors open, uniformed officers standing at attention along the perimeter, men in blue jackets, who she thought might be forensics based on the television she'd watched. Students who had emerged from their dorms to see what was happening despite the late hour. Her time with Len had left her wary of cops. When she was younger, he'd gotten a kick out of having her help with deliveries, because no uniform, campus security or LAPD, was going to stop a chubby kid in braids looking for her big sister on a high school campus. But as she'd gotten older she'd lost the look of someone who belonged in wholesome places. Even when she wasn't carrying, she'd learned to keep well clear of cops. Some of them just seemed to smell the trouble on her. But now she was walking toward them, smoothing her hair with a gloved hand, just another student. Centurion wasn't hard to spot. Alex had met Detective Abel Turner exactly once before. He'd been smiling, gracious, and she'd known in an instant that he hated not only her, but also Darlington and everything related to Lethe. She wasn't sure why he'd been chosen as Centurion, the liaison between Lethe House and the Chief of Police, but he clearly didn't want the job. He stood speaking to another detective and a uniform. He was a full half head taller than either of them, black, his head shaved in a low fade. He wore a sharp navy suit, and what was probably a real Burberry overcoat, and ambition rolled off him like thunder. Too pretty, her grandmother would have said. Queen se prestado se vestio, en medio de la calle se quito. 
Estria Stern didn't trust handsome men, particularly the well-dressed ones. Alex hovered by the barricade. Centurion was on the scene just as Dawes had promised, but Alex wasn't sure how to get his attention or what to do once she had it. The societies met on Thursdays and Sundays. No ritual of any real risk was allowed without Lethe House delegates present, but that didn't mean someone hadn't gone off script. Maybe word had spread that Darlington was in Spain and someone at one of the societies had used the opportunity to mess with something new. She didn't think they had any real malice in mind, but the trips in Mirandas of the world could do plenty of damage without ever meaning to. Their mistakes never stuck. The crowd around her had dispersed almost immediately and Alex remembered how bad she must smell, but there was nothing she could do. About it now. She took out her phone and scrolled through her few contacts. She'd gotten a new phone when she'd accepted Lethe's offer, erasing everyone from her old life in a single act of banishment, so it was a short list of numbers. Her roommates. Her mom, who texted every morning with a series of happy faces, as if emoji were their own incantation. Turner was in there too, but Alex had never texted him, never had cause to. I'm here, she typed, then added, it's Dante, on the very good possibility that he hadn't bothered to add her to his contacts. She watched as Turner drew his phone from his pocket, read the message. He didn't look around. Her phone buzzed a second later. I know. Alex waited for ten minutes, twenty. She watched Turner finish his conversation, consult a woman in a blue jacket, walk back and forth near a marked-off area, where the body must have been found. A cluster of greys was milling around by the gym. Alex let her eyes skim over them, landing nowhere, barely focused. A few were local greys who could always be found in the area, a rower who had drowned off the Florida Keys, but who now returned to haunt the training tanks, a heavy-set man who had clearly once been a football player. She thought she glimpsed the bridegroom, the city's most notorious ghost and a favorite of murder nerds and haunted New England guidebooks. He had reputedly killed his fiancé and himself in the offices of a factory that had once stood barely a mile from here. She didn't let her gaze linger to confirm it. Payne Whitney was always a beacon for greys, steeped in sweat and endeavor, full of hunger and fast-beating hearts. When did you first see them? Darlington had asked on the day they'd first met, the day he'd set the jackals on her. Darlington knew seven languages. He could fence. He knew Brazilian jiu-jitsu and how to rewire an electrical box, could quote poetry and plays by people Alex had never heard of. But he always asked the wrong questions. Alex checked her phone. She'd lost another hour. At this point, she probably shouldn't even bother going to sleep. She knew she wasn't high on Turner's list of priorities, but she was in a bind. She typed, My next call is to Sando. It was a bluff, one Alex almost hoped Turner wouldn't fall for. If he refused to speak to her, she'd happily snitch on him to the dean, but at a more civilized hour. First she'd go home and get two glorious hours of sleep. Instead, she watched Turner take the phone from his pocket, shake his head, and then saunter over to where she stood. His nose wrinkled slightly, but all he said was, Miss Stern, how can I help you? Alex didn't really know, but he'd given her plenty of time to formulate a response. I'm not here to make trouble for you. I'm here because I was told to be. Turner gave a convincing chuckle. We all have jobs to do, Miss Stern. Pretty sure you wish your job entailed wringing my neck right now. I understand that, but it's Thursday night. Preceded by Wednesday, followed by Friday. Go ahead and play dumb. Alex would have been happy to turn her back on him, but she needed something to put in her report. Is there a cause of death? Of course something caused her death. This asshole. I meant. I know what you meant. Nothing definitive yet but I'll be sure to write it up for the dean when we know more. If a society is involved. 
there is no reason to think that. Like he was at a press conference, he added, at this time. It's Thursday, she repeated. Though the societies met twice a week, rituals were only sanctioned on Thursday nights. Sundays were for quiet study and inquiry, which usually meant a fancy meal served on expensive dishes, the occasional guest speaker, and plenty of alcohol. Were you out with the idiots tonight? he said, voice still pleasant. Is that why you smell like pan warmed shit? Who were you with? That kick me troublemaking part of her made her say, You sound like a jealous boyfriend. I sound like a cop. Answer me. The bonesmen are on tonight. He looked bemused. Tell them to return Geronimo's skull. They don't have it, Alex said truthfully. A few years back, Geronimo's heirs had brought suit against the society, but it had come to nothing. The bonesman did have his liver and small intestine in a jar, but she didn't feel this was the moment to point that out. Where's Darlington? Turner asked. Spain. Spain? For the first time, Turner's mild expression gave way. Study abroad. And he left you in charge? Sure did. He must have a lot of faith in you. Sure does. Alex flashed him her most winning grin, and for a second she thought Detective Turner might smile back, because it took a con to know a con. But he didn't. He had to be careful for too long. Where are you from, Stern? Why? Look, he said. You seem like a nice girl, no, said Alex. I don't. Turner raised a brow, cocked his head to the side, assessing, then nodded, conceding the point. All right, he said. You have a job to do tonight and so do I. You did your part. You talked to me. You'll let Sando know a girl died here, a white girl who's going to get plenty of attention without you getting in our way. We're going to keep this far from the university and all the rest. He gave a wave of his hand as if he were distractedly swatting a fly instead of shooing away a century-old cabal of ancient magics. You've done your bit and you can go home. That's what you want, isn't it? Hadn't Alex just thought that very thing? Even so, she hesitated, feeling Darlington's judgment heavy on her. I do. But Dean Sando will want. Turner's mask slipped the fatigue of the night and his anger at her presence suddenly visible. She's town, stern. Back the fuck off. She's town. Not a student. Not connected to the societies. Let it go. Yeah, Alex said. That's fine. Turner smiled, dimples appearing in his cheeks, boyish, pleased, almost a real smile. There you go. He turned away from her, sauntered back to his people. Alex glanced up at the gray, gothic cathedral of Payne Whitney. It didn't look like a gym, but nothing here looked like what it was. That's what you want, isn't it? Detective Abel Turner understood her in a way Darlington never had. Good. Better. Best. That was the trajectory that got you to this place. What Darlington and probably all the rest of these eager, effortful children couldn't understand was that Alex would have happily settled for less than Yale. Darlington was all about the pursuit of perfection, something spectacular. He didn't know how precious a normal life could be, how easy it was to drift away from average. You started sleeping until noon, skipped one class, one day of school, lost one job, then another, forgot the way that normal people did things. You lost the language of ordinary life. And then, without meaning to, you crossed into a country from which you couldn't return. You lived in a state where the ground always seemed to be slipping from beneath your feet, with no way back to someplace solid. It didn't matter that Alex had witnessed the delegates of Skull and Bones predict commodities futures using Michael Reyes's guts or that she'd once seen the captain of the lacrosse team turn himself into a vole. He'd squealed and then, she could have sworn it, pumped his tiny pink fist. 
Lethe was Alex's way back to normal. She didn't need to be exceptional. She didn't even need to be good, just good enough. Turner had given her permission. Go home. Go to sleep. Take a shower. Get back to the real work of trying to pass your classes and make it through the year. Her grades from first semester had been bad enough to land her in academic probation. She's town. Except the societies like to shop town girls and boys for their experiments. It was the whole reason Lethe existed. Or a big part of it. And Alex had spent most of her life as town. She eyed the coroner's van, parked half on and half off the sidewalk. Turner's back was still to her. The mistake people made when they didn't want to get noticed was to try to look casual, so instead she strode toward the van with purpose, a girl who needed to get to the dorms. It was late, after all. When she rounded the back of the vehicle, she shot one quick glance in Turner's direction, then slipped into the wide V of the open van doors as a uniformed coroner turned to her. Hey, she said. He remained in a half-crouch, face-weary, body blocking the view behind him. Alex held up one of the two gold coins she kept tucked in the lining of her coat. You drop this. He saw the glint and without thinking reached out to take it, his response part courtesy, part trained behavior. Someone offered you a boon, you accepted. But it was also a magpie impulse, the lure of something shiny. She felt a little like a troll in a fairy tale. I don't think, he began. But as soon as his fingers closed over the coin, his face went slack, the compulsion taking hold. Show me the body, Alex said, half expecting him to refuse. She'd seen Darlington flash one at a security guard before, but she'd never used a coin of compulsion herself. The coroner didn't even blink, only backed farther into the van and offered her his hand. She clambered up behind him with a quick glance over her shoulder and shut the doors. They wouldn't have much time. All she needed was for the driver or, worse, Turner to come knocking on the door and find her there, having a chat over a corpse. She also wasn't sure how long the compulsion would last. This particular bit of magic had come from manuscript. They specialized in mirror magic, glamours, persuasion. Any object could be enchanted, the most famous being a condom that had convinced a philandering Swedish diplomat to hand over a cache of sensitive documents. The coins took tremendous magic to generate, so they were kept in tight supply at Lethe, and Alex had been stingy with her allotted too. Why was she squandering one now? As Alex joined the coroner in the enclosed space, she saw his nostrils flare at her smell, but his fingers were already on the zipper of the body bag, the coin clutched in his other hand. He was moving too quickly, as if in fast forward, and Alex had the urge to tell him to just stop for a second, but then the moment passed and he was pulling the body bag open, the black vinyl splitting like the skin of a fruit. Jesus, breathed Alex. The girl's face was fragile, blue-veined. She wore a white cotton camisole, torn and puckered, where the knife had entered and retreated, again and again. The wounds were all centered on her heart, and she'd been struck with enough force that it looked as if her sternum had started to give. Way, the bones fracturing in a shallow, bloody crater. Alex was suddenly sorry she hadn't taken Turner's strongly worded advice and gone home. This didn't look like a ritual gone wrong. It looked personal. She swallowed the bile that rose in her throat and forced herself to inhale deeply. If this girl had somehow been targeted by a society or was messing with the uncanny, the smell of the veil should still be on her. But with Alex's own stink filling the ambulance, it was impossible to tell. It's the boyfriend. Alex glanced at the coroner. Compulsions were supposed to make anyone under their power eager to please. How do you know? she asked. Turner said so. They've already picked him up for questioning. He has priors. For what? Dealing and possession. So does she. Of course she did. 
the boyfriend was moving product, and this girl was too. But there was a good long leap from small-time dealing to murder. Sometimes, she reminded herself. Sometimes it's not far at all. Alex looked again at the girl's face. She was blonde, a little like Hell Lie. The resemblance was superficial, at least on the outside. But underneath? In the cut-open places, they were all the same. Girls like Hell Lie, girls like Alex, girls like this one, had to keep running or eventually trouble caught up. This girl just hadn't run fast enough. There were paper bags over her hands, to preserve the evidence, Alex realized. Maybe she'd scratched her attacker. What's her name? It didn't matter, but Alex needed it for her report. Tara Hutchins. Alex typed it into her phone so she wouldn't forget it. Cover her up. She was glad when she couldn't see that brutalized body anymore. This was nasty, ugly, but it didn't mean Tara was connected to the societies. People didn't need magic to be terrible to each other. Time of death, she asked. That seemed like the kind of thing she should know. Sometime around eleven. Hard to pinpoint because of the cold. She paused with her hand on the lever of the van doors. Sometime around eleven. Right around the time two docile greys who had never given anyone any trouble had opened their jaws like they were trying to swallow the world and something had tried to slam its way into a chalk circle. What if that something had found its way to Tara instead? Or what if her boyfriend got fucked up enough to think he could stab straight through to her heart? There were plenty of human monsters out there. Alex had met a few. For now she'd done her part. More than done it. Alex cracked the door to the van, scanned the street, then hopped down. Forget you met me, she told the coroner. A vague, confused expression crossed his face. Alex left him standing, dazed, beside Tara's body and strolled away, crossing the street and keeping to the dark sidewalk, away from the police lights. In a short while, the compulsion would wear off and he'd wonder how he'd ended up with a gold coin in his hand. He would put it in his pocket and forget about it or toss it in the trash without ever realizing the metal was real. She glanced back at the greys gathered around Payne Whitney. Was it her imagination, or was there something in the bent of their shoulders, the way they huddled together by the gymnasium doors? Alex knew better than to look too closely, but in that fleeting moment she could have sworn they looked frightened. What did the dead have to fear? She could hear Darlington's voice in her head, when was the first time you saw them? Low and halting, as if he wasn't sure whether the question was taboo. But the real question, the right question, was, when was the first time you knew to be afraid? Alex was glad he'd never had the sense to ask. 4. Last fall. Come on, Darlington said, helping her to her feet. The illusion will break any minute, and you'll be lying in the front yard like a noon drinker. He half dragged her up the stairs to the porch. She'd handled the jackals well enough, but her color wasn't good and she was breathing hard. You're in terrible shape. And you're an asshole. Then we both have hardships to overcome. You asked me to tell you what you were getting into. Now you know. She yanked her arm away. Tell me. Not try to kill me. He looked at her steadily. It was important she understand. You were never in any danger. But I can't promise that will always be the case. If you don't take this seriously, you could get yourself or someone else hurt. Someone like you? Yes, he said. Most of the time nothing too bad happens at the houses. You'll see things you'd like to forget. Miracles too. But no one completely understands what lies beyond the veil or what might happen if it crosses over. Death waits on black wings and we stand hoplite, who's our, dragoon. She placed her hands on her thighs and peered up at him. You make that up? Cabot Collins. They called him the poet of Lethe. Darlington reached for the door. 
he lost both his hands when an interdimensional portal closed on them. He was reciting his latest work at the time. Alex shuddered. Okay, I get it. Bad poetry, serious business. Are those dogs real? Real enough. They're spirit hounds, bound to serve the sons and daughters of Lethe. Why the long sleeves, Stern? Track marks. Really? He'd suspected that might be the issue, but he didn't quite believe her. She straightened and cracked her back. Sure. Are we going in or not? He bobbed his chin toward her wrist. Show me. Alex lifted her arm, but she didn't shove her sleeve back. She just held it out to him, like he was going to tap a vein for a blood drive. A challenge. One that he suddenly didn't want to accept. It was none of his business. He should say that. Let it go. Instead, he took hold of her wrist. The bones were narrow, sharp in his hand. With his other hand he pushed the fabric of her shirt up the slope of her forearm. It felt like a prelude. No needle punctures. Her skin was covered in tattoos, the curling tail of a rattlesnake, the sunburst bloom of a peony, Anne. The wheel. He resisted the urge to touch his thumb to the image below the crook of her elbow. Dawes would be interested in that bit of tarot. Maybe it would give them something to talk about. Why hide tattoos? No one cares about that here. Half the student body had them. Not many had full sleeves, but they weren't unheard of. Alex yanked her cuff back down. Any other hoops to jump through? Plenty. He pulled open the door and let her inside. The entry was dark and cool, the stained glass throwing bright patterns onto the carpeted floor. Before them, the great staircase wound along the wall to the second story, dark wood carved in a thick sunflower motif. Michelle had told him the staircase alone was worth more than the rest of the house and the land it was built on. Alex released a small sigh. Glad to be out of the sun? She made a soft humming noise. It's quiet here. It took him a moment to understand what she meant. I.L. Bastone is warded. As are the rooms at the hutch. It's that bad? Alex shrugged. Well, they can't get to you here. Alex looked around, her face impassive. Was she unimpressed by the soaring entry, the warm wood and stained glass? the scent of pine and cassis that always made stepping into the house feel a bit like Christmas? Or was she just trying to seem that way? Nice clubhouse, she said. Not very tomb-like. We're not a society, and we don't run like one. This isn't a clubhouse, it's our headquarters, the heart of Lethe, and the storehouse of hundreds of years of knowledge on the occult. He knew he sounded like a horrible prig, but he couldn't seem to stop himself. The societies tap a new delegation of seniors every year, sixteen members, eight women, eight men. We tap a single new Dante, one freshman every three years. Guess that makes me pretty special. Let's hope so. Alex frowned at that, then nodded at the marble bust propped on a table beneath the coat rack. Who's that? The patron saint of Lethe, Hiram Bingham III. Unfortunately, Bingham's boyish features and downturned mouth didn't lend themselves to a mortalization in stone. He looked like a perturbed department store mannequin. Dawes shuffled out of the parlor, her hands curled into the sleeves of her voluminous sweatshirt, her headphones snug around her neck, a vision in beige. Darlington could feel the discomfort radiating off her. Pammy hated new people. It had taken him the better part of his freshman year to win her over, and he still always had the sense that she might be one loud noise away from bolting into the library, never to be seen again. Pamela Dawes, meet our new Dante, Alex Stern. With all the enthusiasm of someone greeting a caller outbreak, Dawes offered her hand and said, Welcome to Lethe. Dawes keeps everything running and ensures I don't make too big a fool of myself. So it's a full-time job, asked Alex. 
Dawes blinked. Evenings and afternoons, but I can make myself available to you with enough notice. She glanced back at the parlor worriedly, as if her long unfinished dissertation was a baby crying. Dawes had served as Oculus for nearly four years and she'd been hammering away. On her dissertation, an examination of Mycenaean cult practices in early tarot iconography, all the while. Darlington decided to put her out of her misery. I'm giving Alex the tour and then I'll take her across campus to the hutch. The hutch, asked Alex. Rooms we keep at the corner of York and Elm. It's not much, but it's convenient when you don't want to trek too far from your dorm. And it's warded too. It's stocked, Dawes said faintly, already scooting back into the parlor in safety. Darlington gestured for Alex to follow him upstairs. Who was Bathsheba Smith? Alex asked on his heels. Then she had been reading her life of Lethe. He was pleased she remembered the name, but, if memory served, Bathsheba appeared on the first page of the first chapter, so he wasn't going to get too excited. The seventeen-year-old daughter of a local farmer. Her body was found in the basement of the Yale Medical School in 1824. She'd been dug up for study by the students. Jesus. It wasn't uncommon. Doctors needed to study anatomy and they needed cadavers to do that. But we think Bathsheba was an early attempt to communicate with the dead. A medical assistant took the fall, and Yale's students learned to keep their activities more quiet. After the discovery of the girl's body, the locals nearly burned Yale to the ground. Maybe they should have, murmured Alex. Maybe. They'd called it the Resurrection Riot, but it hadn't turned truly nasty. Boom or bust, New Haven was a town forever on the brink of things. Darlington toured Alex around the rest of Isle Bastone, the grand parlor, with the old map of New Haven above the fireplace, the kitchen and pantry, the downstairs training rooms, and the second-floor armory, with its wall of apothecary drawers, all of them stocked with herbs and sacred objects. It was left to Dawes to make sure they were kept well supplied, that any perishable items were freshened or disposed of before they turned foul, and to maintain any artifacts that required it. Cuthbert's pearls of protection had to be worn for a few hours every month, or they lost both their luster and their power to protect the wearer from lightning strikes. A Lethe Alum Named Lita Forrest who had once been suspended as an undergrad for causing a campus-wide blackout, had left Lethe with countless inventions, including the revolution clock, which showed an accurate-to-the-minute countdown to armed revolt in countries around the globe. It had twenty-two faces and seventy-six hands and had to be wound regularly or it would simply begin screaming. Darlington pointed out the stores of bone dust and graveyard dirt, with which they would provision themselves on Thursday nights and the rare vials of perdition water, said to come from the seven rivers of hell and that were to be used only in case of emergency. Darlington had never had cause to tap into any of them, but he kept hoping. At the center of the room sat Hiram's crucible, or, as the delegates of Lethe liked to call it, the golden bowl. It was the circumference of a tractor wheel and made of beaten twenty-two carat gold. For years, Lethe knew there were ghosts in New Haven. There were hauntings, rumors of sightings, and some of the societies had managed to pierce the veil through seances and summonings. But Lethe knew there was more, a secret world operating beside ours and frequently interfering with it. Interfering with it how? Alex asked, and he could see the narrow line of her shoulders tighten, that slightly hunched fighter's stance. At the time, no one was sure. They suspected that the presence of greys in sacred circles and temple halls was disrupting the spells and rituals of the societies. There were signs that stray magic loosed from rituals by the interference of greys could cause anything from a sudden frost ten miles away to violent outbursts in schoolchildren. But Lethe had no proof and no way to prevent it. Year after year they attempted to perfect an elixir that would allow them to see spirits, experimenting on themselves through sometimes deadly trial and error. Still, 
they had nothing to show for their work. Until Hiram's crucible. Alex ran her finger against the gilded edge of the basin. It looks like a Sunday. Many of the structures in Machu Picchu were dedicated to the worship of the sun god. This thing came from Peru? Alex asked. You don't need to look so surprised. I know where Machu Picchu is. I can even find Texas on a map if you give me enough time. You'll have to forgive my lack of familiarity with the curriculum of the Los Angeles School District or your interest in same. Forgiven. Maybe, thought Darlington. But Alex Stern looked like the type to hold a grudge. Hiram Bingham was one of the founding members of Lethe. He discovered Machu Picchu in 1911, though that word tends to ruffle feathers, since the locals were perfectly aware of its existence. When Alex said nothing, he added, he was also rumored to be the inspiration for Indiana Jones. Nice, said Alex. Darlington held back a sigh. Of course that would be what got her attention. Bingham stole about 40,000 artifacts. And brought them back here? Yes, to Yale, to be studied at the Peabody. He said they would be returned after 18 months. It took literally 100 years for Peru to get them back. Alex flicked her finger against the crucible and it emitted a low hum. They forget this in the return shipment? It seems pretty hard to miss. The crucible was never documented because it was never given to Yale. It was brought to Lethe. Stolen goods. Very much so, I'm afraid. But it's the key to the Oratserio. The problem with Lethe's elixir wasn't the recipe, it was the vessel. So it's a magical mixing bowl? Such a little heathen. I might not put it that way, but yes. And it's gold all the way through? Before you think about trying to run off with it, keep in mind that it weighs twice as much as you do and that the whole house is warded against theft. If you say so. With his luck she'd find a way to roll the crucible down the stairs into the back of a truck and melt it down for earrings. The elixir has plenty of other names besides Oratserio, he said. The Golden Trial Hiram's Bullet Every time a member of Lethe drinks it. Every time the crucible is used, he takes his life in his hands. The mixture is toxic and the process incredibly painful. But we do it. Again and again. For a glimpse behind the veil. I get it, said Alex. I've met users before. It isn't like that, he wanted to protest. But maybe it was. The rest of the tour was uneventful. Darlington showed her the storage and research rooms in the upper stories, how to use the library, though he warned her not to use it on her own until the house got to know her, and finally the bedroom and adjoining bath, tidied and readied for her as Lethe's new Dante. He'd moved his own things to Virgil's suite at the end of last year, back when he'd still believed he'd have a proper protege. He'd felt embarrassingly sentimental about it all. Virgil's quarters were a floor above Dante's and twice as large. When he graduated, they would be left empty so that they would be available to him if he chose to visit. The vanity had belonged to Eliezer Wheelock. Half of the wall facing the bed was taken up by a stained glass window depicting a hemlock wood, positioned so that, as the sun rose and set throughout the day, the colors of the glass trees and the sky above it seemed to change as well. When he'd moved in, he discovered that Michelle had left him a bottle of brandy and a note on her last visit. This is the forest primeval. The murmuring pines and the hemlocks. Bearded with moss, and in garment green, indistinct in the twilight. Stand like druids of ELD, with voices sad and prophetic. There was a monastery that produced Armagnac so refined, its monks were forced to flee to Italy when Louis XIV joked about killing them to protect their secrets. This is the last bottle. Don't drink it on an empty stomach, and don't call unless you're dead. Good luck, Virgil. He'd always thought Longfellow was tripe, but he'd treasured the note and the brandy anyway. 
Now he watched Alex sweating amid the luxury of his old rooms, rooms that had been rarely used but much beloved, the dark blue walls, the canopied bed with its heavy teal covers, the armoire painted with white. Dogwood. The stained glass here was more modest, two elegant windows, clouds and shades of blue and violet set atop starry skies, bracketing a fireplace of painted tiles. Alex stood at the center of it all, her arms wrapped around her middle, turning slowly. He thought again of Undine. But maybe she was just a girl lost at sea. He had to ask. When did you first see them? She glanced at him, then at the window above her, the moon waxing forever in a stained glass sky. She picked up the Ryuge music box from the desk, touched her finger to the lid, but then thought better of it, set it down. Darlington was a good talker, but he was happiest when no one was speaking to him, when he didn't have to perform the ritual of himself and he could simply be left to watch others. Alex had a grainy quality to her, like an old film. He could tell she was making a choice. Whether to reveal her secrets? Whether to run? She shrugged and he thought she would leave it at that, but then she picked up the music box again and said, I don't know. I thought they were people for a while, and it's not like anyone pays attention to a kid talking to no one. I remember seeing a fat guy in nothing but socks and undershorts, holding a remote control in one hand like a teddy bear and standing in the middle of the street. I remember trying to tell my mom he was going to get hurt. On our trip to the Santa Monica Pier, I saw a woman lying in the water like a picture of, she gestured as if stirring a pot. With her hair and the flowers? Ophelia. Ophelia. She followed me home, and when I cried and shouted at her to leave, she just tried to push closer. They like tears. The salt, the sadness, any strong emotion. Fear, she asked. She was so still, as if she were posing for a portrait. Fear. Few greys were malevolent but they did love to startle and terrify. Why aren't there more of them? Shouldn't they be everywhere? Only a few greys can pass through the veil. The vast majority remain in the afterlife. I'd see them at the supermarket, around the hot foods case or those pink bakery boxes. They loved our school cafeteria. I didn't think about it much. Until Jacob Craig asked if I wanted to see his thing. I told him I'd seen plenty of them, and somehow it got back to his mom, and she called the school. So the teacher brings me in and asks, What do you mean you've seen lots of things? I didn't know to lie. She plunked the music box down. If you want to get child protective services called fast, just start talking about ghost dick. Darlington wasn't sure what he'd expected. A dead highwayman lurking romantically at the window? a banshee roaming the banks of the Los Angeles River, like La Llorona? There was something so ordinary and awful about her story. About her. Someone had reported Alex's case to CPS, and one of Lethe's search algorithms, or one of their many contacts in one of the many bureaus that they paid off had caught mention of those notable keywords, delusions. Paranoia. Ghosts. From that point on, she'd probably been watched. And that night in the apartment on Cedros? She frowned and then said, Oh, you mean ground zero. Don't tell me you haven't read the file. I have. I want to know how you survived. Alex rubbed her thumb over the edge of the windowsill. So do I. Was that enough? Darlington had seen the crime scene photos, video taken by officers arriving on scene. Five men dead, all of them beaten nearly unrecognizable, two of them staked through the heart like vampires. Despite the carnage, blood spatter indicated it was all the work of one perpetrator, arcs of red, every vicious blow struck from left to right. Something was off about the whole thing, but Alex was never a suspect. For one thing, she was right-handed, and for another, she was far too small to have wielded a weapon with so much force. Besides, 
she had enough fentanyl in her system that she was lucky she hadn't dyed herself. Her hair had been wet and she'd been found naked as a newborn. Darlington had dug a little deeper, unable to shake his suspicions, but there had been no blood or remains in the drain, if she'd somehow been involved, she hadn't showered the proof away. So why had the attacker left the girls alone? If the police were right and this was some kind of beef with another dealer, why spare Alex and her friend? Drug dealers who beat people to death with bats didn't seem like the spare the women and children type. Maybe the attacker had believed they were dead already from the drugs. Or maybe. Alex had tipped someone off. But she knew something more about what had happened than she'd told the police. He felt it in his bones. How lie and I got high, she said quietly, still brushing her finger against the windowsill. I woke up in the hospital. She didn't wake up at all. She looked very small suddenly and Darlington felt a stab of shame. She was twenty, older than most freshmen, but she was still just a kid in a lot of ways, in over her head. And she'd lost friends that night, her boyfriend, everything familiar. Come with me, he said. He wasn't sure why. Maybe because he felt guilty for prying. Maybe because she didn't deserve to be punished for saying yes to a bargain no right-minded person would refuse. He led her back to the gloom of the armory. It had no windows, and its walls were lined in shelves and drawers nearly two stories high. It took him a moment to find the cupboard he wanted. When he rested his hand on the door, the house paused, then let the lock give with a disapproving click. Carefully, he removed the box, heavy, gleaming black wood, inlaid with mother of pearl. You'll probably need to remove your shirt, he said. I'll give Dawes the box and she can. Dawes doesn't like me. Dawes doesn't like anyone. Here, she said. She pulled the shirt over her head, revealing a black bra and ribs shadowed like the furrows of a tilled field. Don't get Dawes. Why was she so willing to put herself in his hands? Was she unafraid or just reckless? Neither trait boded well for her future at Lethe. But he had the sense that it was neither of those things. It felt like she was testing him now, like she'd laid down another challenge. Some propriety wouldn't kill you, he said. Why take the chance? Usually when a woman takes her clothes off in front of me I have some warning. Alex shrugged, and the shadows moved over her skin. Next time, I'll light the signal fires. That would be best. Tattoos covered her from wrist to shoulder and spread beneath her clavicles. They looked like armor. He opened the box's lid. Alex drew in a sudden breath and skittered backward. What's wrong? he asked. She'd retreated nearly halfway across the room. I don't like butterflies. They're moths. They perched in even rows in the box, soft white wings fluttering. Whatever. I'll need you to stay still, he said. Can you? Why? Just trust me. It will be worth it. He considered. If it's not, I'll drive you and your roommates to Ikea. Alex balled her shirt in her fists. And take us for pizza after. Fine and dear Aunt Eileen is going to buy me some new fall clothes. Fine. Now come here, you coward. She crossed back to him in a kind of sideways shuffle, averting her eyes from the contents of the box. One by one, he took out the moths and laid them gently on her skin. One at her right wrist, her right forearm, the crook of her elbow, her slender biceps, the knob of her shoulder. He repeated the process with her left arm, then placed two moths at the points of her collarbones where the heads of two black snakes curled, their tongues nearly meeting at the hollow of her throat. Chabash, he murmured. The moths beat their wings in unison. Uverat. They flapped their wings again and began to turn gray. Mamash. With each beat of their wings, the moths grew darker and the tattoos started to fade. Alex's chest rose and fell in jagged, 
rapid bursts. Her eyes were wide with fear, but as the moths darkened and the ink vanished from her skin, her expression changed, opened. Her lips parted. She's seen the dead, he thought. She's witnessed horrors. But she's never seen magic. This was why he had done it, not because of guilt or pride, but because this was the moment he'd been waiting for, the chance to show someone. Else wonder, to watch them realize that they had not been lied to, that the world they'd been promised as children was not something that had to be abandoned, that there really was something lurking in the wood, beneath the stairs, between the stars, that everything was full of mystery. The moths beat their wings again, again, until they were black, then blacker. One by one they tipped from her arms and dropped to the floor in a faint patter. Alex's arms were bare, stripped of all sign of the tattoos, though in places where the needle had gone deep, he could still discern faint ridges. Alex held her arms out, breath coming in gasps. Darlington gathered the moth's fragile bodies, placing them gently in the box. Are they dead, she whispered. Ink drunk. He shut the lid and placed the box back in the cupboard. This time the lock's click seemed more resigned. He and the house were going to have to have a discussion. Address moths were originally used for transporting classified material. Once they drank a document, they could be sent anywhere in a coat pocket or a box of antiques. Then they'd be placed on a fresh sheet of paper and would recreate the document to the word. As long as the recipient knew the right incantation. So we could put my tattoos on you? They might not fit quite right, but we could. Just be careful, he waved a hand. In the throes. Human saliva reverses the magic. Only human? Yes. Feel free to let a dog lick your elbows. Then she turned her gaze on him. In the shadows of the room, her eyes looked black, wild. Is there more? He didn't have to ask what she meant. Would the world keep unraveling? Keep spilling its secrets? Yes. There's plenty more. She hesitated. Will you show me? If you let me. Alex smiled then, a small thing, a glimpse of the girl lurking inside her, a happy, less haunted girl. That was what magic did. It revealed the heart of who you'd been before life took away your belief in the possible. It gave back the world all lonely children longed for. That was what Lethe had done for him. Maybe it could do that for Alex as well. Months later, he would remember the weight of the moth's bodies in his palm. He would think of that moment and how foolish he had been to think he knew her at all.